the world beyond. The Christian life can be divided into two stages, the Red Sea stage and the River Jordan stage, and there's a wilderness in between. What the cross is to us, the Red Sea was to Israel, a symbol of their redemption, their deliverance from the bondage of Egypt by the mighty hand of God. They looked back to the Red Sea as we look back to the cross. They celebrated Passover as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But it wasn't enough just to get them out of Egypt. Moses explained in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 23 that God brought them out that he might bring them in. God's purpose in redemption is not just not just to get your sins forgiven. God's purpose in redemption was not realized for Israel until they entered the promised land. And to enter that land, they had to cross the Jordan River. Only then would God's redemptive purpose be fulfilled. Now, it might surprise you to learn that Canaan in the Bible never symbolizes heaven. We sing, On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to that fair and happy land. Well, where my possessions lie. Hey, why in the world are you standing on this side of the Jordan casting a wishful eye to the other side? Why don't you just cross right on over? You see, Canaan in the Bible is a symbol of the life that God wants us to have right here and now. Not the sweet by and by. Right now. You see, God's purpose in redemption was to bring them out that he might bring them in. And that's God's purpose for us. Well, <clears throat> there are no giants in heaven as in Canaan. There were battles in Canaan. There are no battles in heaven. There, there is sin among God's people in Canaan. There is no sin in heaven. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you that is that Canaan is a type of the victorious, abundant Christian experience which we can have right here and now in Jesus Christ. Canaan represents the fullness of salvation, the fullness of blessing. It's receiving all that God has for us. God brought us out that he might bring us in. Now, the, the tragic thing is that many Christians are out, but they're not in. We were never meant to stand on Jordan's stormy banks, casting a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where our possessions lie. We're meant to conquer the land, we're meant to possess it, and such some church members are still living in Egypt, and some are still wandering around in the wilderness, and some have, have lived on samples of the fruit of the land, and others, maybe they make a, a little foray into Canaan once in a while, but they fear the giants that are in that land, just as Israel feared the giants of Canaan. <clears throat> Escape from slavery in Egypt was not God's goal for his people. He took them out of Egypt in order to bring them to their own land, the land that he had promised them. Generations before, God had made that promise to Abraham. As Abraham looked stood and looked over the strip of land between the Mediterranean Sea and the River Jordan. God said to him, <clears throat> Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Freedom from Egypt was only the first step. 
until they occupied Canaan, they would not experience God's complete rescue operation. And so in the same way, God's motive, God's purpose in saving us was not just to get us out of hell into heaven. That's just a bonus. The real goal is for us to experience here and now all that he has promised us in Jesus Christ. And too many Christians are still living under that old Spanish motto, no more beyond. I shudder when I hear a professed believer in Christ shrug, shrug his shoulders and say, oh, what else is there? What more can there be? Well, I want to tell you, you don't have to wait unto death and you don't have to go through a graveyard to realize the abundance that God wants us to know in Jesus Christ and to experience in him. <clears throat> Here's a man lost in a blizzard. And he's going to perish unless he finds shelter. And off in the distance he sees a light and he makes his way toward that light. Here is a beautiful mansion. He goes up to the door. There's a note on the door that says, enter in. And he says, oh, they'll never receive me. I'm unworthy to enter a place like this. I'm dirty. I'm unworthy. But he knows if he stays outside, he's going to die. He says, I've got to, I've got to believe this. I've got to trust this. I've got to act on it. So he opens the door and he goes in. There's another note in there that says, come on in. There's everything provided for you. There's food for you. There's a warm bath for you. There's clothing for you. There's a comfortable bed for you. There's entertainment for you. Come on in and avail yourself of everything. The man says, oh, I'm safe enough. I'm, I'm safe from the storm. I'm secure, and I'll just stay here. Now, it would be foolish for him. He's safe, all right. But why doesn't he go on in and enjoy all the provisions? And so it is with a lot of God's people. They may have crossed over the Red Sea, but they never entered into the land. They haven't crossed the Jordan. And so they're wandering around in the, in the wilderness and, in, uh, and struggling. And Well, I just want to share with you something here pertaining to Joshua chapter 14. I want us to look at Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. The context of that passage is Joshua dividing up the land of Canaan into portions for each of the tribes apart from the tribe of Levi, as you remember. And now in this passage, the tribe of Judah is being assigned the, the southern territory. One of their leaders, a man by the name of Caleb, came to Joshua, and this is essentially what he said. He said, I'm 85 years old now, but 45 years ago, I came to this place of hill territory, and along with the 11 other spies, we surveyed this part of the land. It was inhabited then by the... Am, uh, uh, Amakites, Anakites, as it still is today. And I tell you, they breathe fear into all those other spies. Forty-five years ago, we turned our backs upon the promised land and we went the other way. Now you'll see that, epi that episode in Numbers chapter 13. We saw the Nephilim there. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Now here were <laughs> these huge people. These fierce people that inhabited the land. But two of those spies. <clears throat> Caleb and Joshua. Remember? 
Caleb said to Joshua, 45 years later, there's a piece of unfinished business. Give me this territory. Give me these mountains occupied by the Anakites. And with the Lord helping me, I'll drive them out. Now it's interesting that Caleb, here he is, 85 years of age. He's planning to assault hill country. But the hill country wasn't the real issue. The real issue is that the Anakites occupied it and it had been fear of them that had, had sentenced the entire nation of Israel to spend the next 38 years in the wilderness before entering Canaan and fulfilling the purpose and the will of God for them. So Caleb was motivated by unfinished business. And I want to say to you, there's unfinished business for us today. There's unfinished business for us to take care of. And none of us is exempt from this task. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ has a strategy for us. You and I are part of it. And there's unfinished business in the world today. And I want to apply these, these principles to this business of using the authority that God has given us and uh, let's don't leave out of our equation the way we evaluate things let's don't leave out the power and the authority of God so <clears throat> when the ten spies came back from Israel from, from Canaan they gave their negative report Caleb was not suffering from a grasshopper complex. Caleb was the Columbus of the party. He believed that there was more beyond. He said, let's go in right now. Let's possess the land. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. Let's possess the land because we're able to do it. He had another spirit. While the others cowered like grasshoppers before the giants of Canaan, Caleb stood on God's promises and declared that the giants would be bread for them. We'll make sandwiches out of them, he said. And a generation later, as Israel acted in God's power, they found him spreading a banquet table for them. God's power gives us victory over the giants in and around us. We become not only giant defeaters, we become giant eaters. In our church life today, our greatest need is not another building, not another program, not another preacher, but another spirit. We get excited about earthly possibilities and scientific advancements and reaching other planets maybe to hide our embarrassment at not knowing how to live on earth. And yet the greatest of all unexplored worlds lies right before us. And that is the life that's hid with Christ in God. The average Christian has barely set foot on the fringe of that land. There is so much more beyond. I want to share with you, first of all, Caleb was characterized by realism <clears throat> he came back and reported to Moses those spies those spies that had been sent out said Moses everything God said about the land is true we've never seen such fertility such fruit it flows with milk and honey it's a wonderful place but now too many of us use that word too often and how often that little word but changes everything in scripture but the people who live there are powerful the cities are fortified and very large and, and uh, the land is great everything God said about the land is wonderful but Moses you've got to understand 
Some very strange people lived there. And ten of the spies said, We can't do it. The task is too great. The obstacles are too large. The force of the enemy is too overwhelming. We can't do it. But two were different. I like what God says about Caleb in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. God says, Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Inherit it. Now, most of us from time to time get cold feet, don't we? We look at the giants before us and we turn the other way. But here and there, there are people with a different spirit. And I want to challenge you to be a man, a woman of a different spirit. Now, Caleb was characterized, characterized by realism. Look at Joshua chapter 14, verse 12. He says, we can do it. He was not unaware of the implications of his words. Forty-five years ago, Caleb promised himself that one day he would get back to that territory where God revealed his plan, but they failed because of fear. Okay, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 2, we read what God's purpose had been. He intended to give the land to Israel in verse 17 that is Numbers chapter 13 verses 17 and following <clears throat> we see that Moses 12 spies did a thorough job and uh, they gave their report and added that little word but and they said there's no way we can do it now Caleb did not have his hand his head in the sand he knew the problems. He saw everything the other spies saw. Everything. He saw the fortified cities. He saw the, those armies trained in warfare. He knew that in reality, these Israelites were unable, ill-equipped to take them on. But what the other spies left out Caleb and Joshua didn't leave out that God was in the business Numbers 14 8 if the Lord is pleased with us he will lead us into that land the land flowing with milk and honey and he will give it to us and that was what made them men of a different spirit the obstacles were great the enemies were overwhelming. And they said if we're dependent only on our own strength, if we're dependent only on human strategy and resources, then we better turn around and head red, right back into the desert. But this is God's business. And Joshua and Caleb said he's going to give us the victory in that situation. That isn't just boasting. That is realism. Now look, dear friends, we need to be absolutely realistic about this world with all of its needs, with all of its problems, with all of its difficulties, with all of its corruption, with all of its antagonism, and with all of its opposition to the gospel and to Jesus Christ, with all of its downplaying of righteousness and all of its hellish destruction but at the same time we need to be utterly realistic about God and about God's plans about God's commands about God's provisions about God's resources about God's authority and God's might you know it might be difficult for us sitting here at this conference with God's people and the sun shining to think objectively of a hurting world maybe you haven't had time to listen to the news this week but you know what escapism is not God's plan for us 
We don't hide our head in the sand and become blind to all the outside world. The moral structures of society are falling all around us. Our leaders disappoint us with their lack of godliness and fear of God. And our children are growing up in an unsecure half the world uh, or more. Uh, going to bed hungry, desperate conditions, violence and corruption all around us and the threats of other religions and terrorism. I'm telling you, all of this, and we're realistic about it. We need to see. We need to see our world as it is. God sent the spies into Canaan with their eyes wide open. Joshua and Caleb lost the day when they came back to Kadesh Barnea and the other ten spies said, we can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, if it's God's strength, we can do it. In our own strength we can, but in God's strength we can. But the others prevailed, and the children of Israel spent the next 38 years wandering in the wilderness until all these men over 20, with the exception of these two, died and were buried in the desert. Now it's 45 years later. Seven years into Canaan. And Caleb said, I've not forgotten. I've not forgotten that they're bigger than we are. I've not forgotten that they made us feel like grasshoppers. I've not forgotten that they filled us with fear when we were here before. But I've also not forgotten that God is still on the throne. And God has declared that it's His will to give me this territory and I'm going into battle. Look at Caleb's mixture of past and present and future. He said the Anakites were there. Their cities were large and fortified. And look at, look at this. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. As he said. The past belongs to the enemy, but the future tense belongs to God. He is my strength. He's the one who's giving me the land, just as he promised. There are many of us who are overwhelmed by the world. We look around us at all the challenges. We see the growing strength of Islam. We see the dangers of terrorists. And we, we come back and say, it's too much. We can't do it. We see all the, the advances of paganism. We need to be realistic. And we need to know that no matter how threatening the world may be, no matter how much of a losing battle we feel that we are in fighting in when we seek to serve God in this world, we need to realize that God is our authority. God is our strength. There are people who go to some parts of the world. They serve God for years without any evidence of any tangible fruit. But God is doing something. Abraham never saw what God promised him. But said Jesus, he saw my day. His sight was fixed on Christ. So I want to say to you, be realistic about the situation you're facing. Don't pretend there's no hardship. Don't pretend there's no challenge. Be realistic about the strength of the enemy. But also, you should be characterized by responsibility. Be realistic about the needs of the world, about the strength of the enemy, but be realistic that God always has a plan and a purpose and a strategy. God is going to do something. What should be our first response when we see the challenges of the world? Is it to muster a team 
and to go out and take the world Caleb's first response was to find out the will of God what has God said about the situation and we've seen his will God gave his will in Numbers chapter 13 verse 2 his will was that the Israelites should occupy the land now that was very general of course but we need to understand we need to begin with an understanding of what God's general will is and we see what it is that is God wants us to go all over the world and to disciple all nations go and make disciples no exemptions there that's the will of God in Numbers chapter 14 verse 8 God's will is narrowed down a little bit Caleb and Joshua said if the Lord is pleased with us he will lead us into that land and he will give it to us verse 24 I'll bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it and God is speaking more specifically now Joshua chapter 14 verse 9 Caleb said on that day Moses swore to me the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you followed the Lord my God forever so when you accept the general will of God God reveals to you his specific will and you will never know what the specific will of God is in your life until you are living in obedience to the general will of God for your life you'll never find out what does God want me to do personally until you're totally obedient to what you know uh, what he wants for all Christians what I'm saying is God has given us his general will where do you fit in what is your place in accomplishing the purpose of God well are you committed to him in the first place God said my will is for you to take this land are you committed to that are you going back into the wilderness you will never find out your part in God's plan of taking the land until you have accepted that will of God and are obedient to it that it is his plan that you have uh, to live in that land God has something for us tonight and I wonder what is what are the seeds of your ambitions what are the seeds of your dreams and your visions is it the will of God you have dreams of comfort and security and well-being and of a great ministry are these God's plans for you at any stage in life what is God's plan for me for my possessions for my abilities for my talents for my gifts for my resources maybe even like Caleb at 85 years of age perhaps God said something to you years ago 30 years ago God said something to you 10 years ago God said something to you it has never come to pass yet maybe for you the time has come and maybe it's time for you to say give me this mountain never ask never ask as your first question about anything is it possible ask instead is it right is this what God wants if you ask is this possible then you will live only on the realm of the possible that's the way every man and woman on the street lives today but if you ask is it right this is this the way of God there be times in your life when God will show you things that will seem to you to be impossible but God will make the impossible possible some of us have been intimidated in our ministry we've been intimidated by all the obstacles by the sheer impossibility of the situation we live only on the realm of the possible and we don't take risk 
We don't go over the edge. We don't step out of the boat, much less allow God to torpedo the boat. But today, God is speaking to you. True responsibility in the Christian life is not found in my promising God that I will do a certain thing for Him, but in my responding to His ability. Let me show you the difference. I can make promises to God. Lord, I'm going to serve you. Lord, I'm going to do this for you. Lord, I have all of these plans. No, I'm to say, Lord, I'm available. I'm available to you. I want you to do whatever you will. With your ability, do it through me. That's exactly what Caleb did. He said, this is God's business. And that's what comes through Caleb all the way through in the book of Numbers, in the book of Joshua. As I respond in obedience to what God has revealed, not taking on my own shoulders the responsibility to make things happen, only as they obeyed, only as they trusted in God who gave them the territory, would it come to pass. God calls me to serve Him. But I want to tell you something. Your responsibility in obedience is to trust God's ability to bring it about in your life. What He desires. What His plan is. And that's why back in the book of Numbers, Caleb said, He will lead us. He will give us the land. It's the Lord who's with us. And now 45 years later, he said, the Lord helping me, I will drive them out of this land. It's his will. It's his initiative. I'll obey. And the Lord helping me in his strength, responding to his abilities, things are going to happen. All right. Two things so far. Caleb was realistic about the situation. Second thing, he recognized his responsibility. And his responsibility was what? To allow God to accomplish things through him, not on his own strength and power and authority. Third thing, Caleb was characterized by risk. Without risk, the will of God rarely becomes the experience of God, and you'll never prove what God can do through you unless you take a risk. I'm not talking about taking a risk or being reckless in things of your own choosing. Not at all. I'm talking about those things of obedience, such as the risk that Peter took when he got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. He never proved what God could do without taking a risk. Now, the book of Joshua is the story of God giving the land to Israel. It was God giving it to them against overwhelming odds. But every act of God in the book of Joshua, you will find, is precipitated by an act of obedience. Now, think about it. Before you see God acting, you see obedience. <clears throat> Look through. Joshua, number, Joshua chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Joshua, take the ark of the covenant on the shoulders of the priest and go and stand in the Jordan River. When they obeyed what God said, what happened? He opened the waters of the Jordan River. Go against the city of Jericho. March around it every day, once a day for six days. And seven times on the seventh day you obey and I'll give you the city. In other words, every act of God first demands obedience on our part. And there's a risk. Just somebody says, well, just suppose that when we start marching around the city, they, they drop rocks on us. Suppose when we're marching around the city... They pour boiling oil down upon us. There's a risk. 
God says, just do what I tell you to do. You remember when Jesus said to these would-be disciples, follow me, do you ever see where one of them asks, where are you going? Show me where you're going, then I'll decide whether I'll follow you or not. There is a risk. And if you stand firm and refuse to move, before you've got all the details, you'll never take the first step. There is a risk. Now God may not announce to you in advance what's going to happen, what He's going to do. God may not show you in advance the provisions He's going to give you and the resources that He'll make available to you. He may not give you... a when he called Abraham to leave Ur, he didn't give him a map. He just said, go. Told him nothing of his provisions. I want to tell you, you will never prove God sitting in an armchair with your arms folded saying, come on God, do something. Never. <clears throat> All these great people of the Bible proved what God could do by taking a risk. All through the Bible, every time God worked, there was an act of obedience which precipitated God working. You'll never know the will of God without taking a risk. And you know what? I think we'll never be 100% sure of the will of God until maybe we're, we take that first step. It's like going into a dark room and you can't see a thing. You strike a match and there's enough light for you. In other words, you've got about 10% of the light that you need to cross the room. So what do you do? Are you going to wait until the whole room is flooded with light? No, you walk in the light that you have. And then... There's another match. You go for until you're safely through. What I am saying to you is, you may not see the whole picture before you, but God gives you enough light, enough knowledge for you to take that first step. And always, as you look back over your shoulder, you can see, you can say, the Lord has led me. But beforehand, if you're like me, you're never 100% sure. And you say, well, suppose it's wrong. Suppose I miss it. If you're wrong, don't panic. I want to tell you something I've learned over my years of ministry. I believe this as firmly as I believe anything. If you miss it, God puts it right based on your heart of obedience. And I'll tell you why you'll never go wrong. Because we're told in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. If you go wrong, don't panic. Because God looks at your heart to see your obedience, your motive. And if you go wrong, God will bring you back on track. And I want to make a statement here. I hope you write it down. And I hope you live by what I'm about to say to you. And I hope you act upon it. If you worry about going wrong, you'll never go right either. People who worry about going wrong will never accomplish anything. People who worry about going wrong will never go right either. There's risk. Some of us have never taken that risk. Obedience is not only risky, it's costly. And yet there are wonderful benefits and blessings in doing the will of God. I know what I'm talking about. I do know. Pastor asked me to share some things with you that are very personal to me. I had, as a young man, 
As a young man, I was a star in my denomination. And I was used more than anybody in the state in which I lived in conferences. This, this young man sitting here can testify to, to my ministry years back in this particular denomination. But God began to deal with me. And as I told you in the other session, I had to throw it down. I had to throw down this ministry. I, I had a, I was sharing with a friend of mine later on about some things. He listened to me. And uh, he listened to the scriptures I shared. He said, what you're saying may be right. But if I do that, I'll lose my ministry. He was right. He would lose his ministry. But what he didn't count on was God had a greater ministry for him. Would you throw away paste in order to get real diamonds? Would you give up just a trinket to get a priceless jewel? Well, there I was with this ministry that I had to throw down because you know what? That ministry was a snake to me. It harbored a snake. Oh, it could be fruitful in my own strength and so forth. But it could be dangerous. And only in the hands of God. What I'm saying is there is a risk. My risk was exactly what I told you. Losing my ministry. And I did lose it. I did. I was disowned. I was disowned by my denomination and what I had was no more it was over with but God took me somewhere I did not know a single person where I went I had no contacts I had no ministry nothing no invitations to speak it anywhere but I walked in obedience to God Jesus said, if you're faithful in little things, I'll make you responsible over greater things. When we hang on to what we have and keep our hand grasped firmly over it and refuse to let it go, that's what we have. We'll never have any more. God cannot give his gifts into a hand that's already closed. There's a risk. I'm telling you that there is a risk in following God. But it's worth it. And when you're faithful in what you know of God's will, he'll lead you further on. Jesus warned us there, there's a cost though and he, he told us that we should count the cost of being a true disciple and you better count the cost yeah it cost me but I tell you the dividends far greater it's cost some of you and it may cost you more leaving things that are dear to you leaving your security there is a risk some of us don't want any cost we want a deluxe first class, first class ride to heaven but I tell you you won't know the blessing of God not in the way that you could know it if you were to say Lord your will be done You'll never know until you come to that point. I'm going to ask you to take a risk. Now what risk is God's business? That's not for me to say. And that obedience where he leads you, he will show you in his way. And what, does, what kind of people, what kind of leader 
does this call for? Here was Caleb, 85 years old, and he wholly followed the Lord as God. Caleb carried out a purpose. He was not following God with ifs, hesitations, reservations, provisos. Lord, I'll follow you if, I'll follow you dependent upon, and so on. He wasn't following God with one hand behind his back crossing his fingers. He claimed a promise. God had promised him a mountain and now he was laying claim to it. To Caleb, a promise from God was not a motto to hang on the wall. It was a check to cash. And now he was ready to cash it. He did not pray, give me strength to match my mountain. He prayed, give me a mountain to match my strength. He was ready he said, give me this mountain. He wasn't asking for a molehill, not a pension, not for a soft retirement. He had no intention of just fading away like an old soldier. He carried out a purpose. He claimed a promise, but he also counted on a presence. He said, if so be, the Lord will be with me, I'll be able to drive them out. And that if is not an if of doubt, but a, of humility. He doesn't claim victory because he's brave. He doesn't claim victory because of his own strength. He doesn't claim victory because he's got the enthusiasm. He claims victory because of the assurance of the presence of God. We leave God out of our calculations these days. We look at the situation and we say, if we have enough education, if we have enough ability, if we have enough people, if we have enough money, if we have enough personality, listen, it is not our efficiency, it's God's sufficiency that counts. God is sufficient. And then Caleb conquered a possession. He, Hebron the city of refuge there was a quest he wholly followed God there was a request Lord give me this mountain and there was a conquest he took the mountain there was a bequest Hebron became his inheritance I want you to make up your mind that there's more beyond where you are right now now you may be at the pinnacle you think but I'm saying to you there's more. There's more beyond. You know, I hope, I hope you never are content. I think within every Christian, there ought to be what I call a holy discontent. I don't mean discontent with the Lord or discontent with what you're doing, but discontent in the sense that you know that there's more. There's more to do. There's more to be. And make up your mind to that. There are some rugged mountains out there today. But you can wholly follow the Lord. And mountains that seem to you to be obstacles would become your possessions. Amen. Mountains that once stand in your way, you'll discover are the way that God has for you. He said in Isaiah, I'll make the mountains a highway. Those things you think are obstacles are actually the way that God wants you to go and to get to where He wants to take you. Let this be an example to you that no matter what stage you are, you still have the same equation that Joshua had. Put God in it and it offsets anything. Whatever is over on this side of the equation, all the enemy, all the things that threaten, that never, never, never offsets the strength of God, the authority of God. And when you've got God in the equation, 
the solution always comes out correctly. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will realize that there's more for us, not in our own strength. We do not claim, Lord, that we have the energy, that we have the authority or the power, but we say with Caleb, with God's help, we can do it. Amen.